Welcome back to the 6Ps podcast and today's episode is going to focus on essay writing on Alfred Hitchcock's film, Rewindow. To start with, let's look at the basics of essay writing and this is a text response essay. You are focusing solely on Rewindow. This isn't a comparative text, obviously. We're aiming in the exam and the SAC to write between 900 and 1200 words approximately. That's sort of the sweet spot. And you need to explore a specific question. That means all aspect, aspects, I should say, of that question. The main goal is to showcase your knowledge of the text on the SAC and on the exam. We want to see you bringing out your best evidence and your best analysis in relation to whatever topic you get given. Let's look at this sample topic, and this comes from the 2018 VCAR exam. Jeff's fascination with looking at others stops him from truly looking at himself. Do you agree? This is a statement question. You'll notice that there are single quotation marks around the statement. If it was a quotation from the film, you would find it would be double quotation marks. So the single quotation marks suggest to us that it's a statement and we just have to respond to the statement. And the first thing you should always do is to highlight the key aspects or the key words in the topic provided to you. In this case, we're looking at fascination, looking at others, stops him, and truly really looking at himself. Those are the phrases that I would pick out from this. And if you notice sort of Jeff's fascination with looking at others, it's not explicitly referenced, but the key theme they sort of want you to focus on is voyeurism. So when you look at a topic, if you don't see, I guess, the key themes or the key ideas that you've looked at in class, really think about what the question is asking you and think about synonyms or other ways you could perhaps say phrases. So in this case, we could say Jeff's obsession with voyeurism stops him from truly looking at himself. It's asking us if we agree or not. And for me, something that I wanna sort of pinpoint here is arguments or ideas that you could sort of talk about when it comes to this specific topic, because it's really important that whichever way you argue, and we'll get onto contentions in a moment, you need three clear ideas or three key reasons to support your overall contention. With planning, as I said before, it's really important that you formulate a contention by answering the questions, whether you agree, you partially agree, or, or you disagree, or to what extent, as sometimes I will ask you. In this case, a contention could be that yes, you agree that Jeff's voracic tendencies do stop him from introspection, from self-reflecting on his own values and views. Or something that I don't mind doing is, I guess, arguing both ways, but be really careful not to contradict yourself. So in this case, Jeff's voyeuristic tendencies initially stop him from looking at his own life, but ultimately he's able to self-reflect and work out what he truly values. And that for me could be some something or someone, I should say, like Lisa Fremont. Now, your arguments or your reasons should support your contention. And if you're really struggling uh, for, to, to find reasons or to find arguments, I like to add the word because on the end of my contention. So for the first one, like Jeff's voyeuristic tendency stop him from introspection because um, he's living vicariously, because it supports his preconceived ideas about gender or about marriage. So that's a way you could sort of Use the word because on the end of your contention as a way to find arguments or ideas if you are really struggling. When you are planning, it's really important to plan out your evidence. The reason being, you really don't want to repeat your evidence. You don't want to use the same quotations or the same analysis or the same film techniques over and over again. So as you're planning out your ideas, really think about what evidence you want to use and make sure you don't double up. Consult your quotations or your key scene analysis table or your notes as well, initially when you're planning out essays. Now, in the SAC and in the exam, you won't have access to these, but I think particularly early on, I think these can be really, really useful in helping you, I guess, condense the amount of evidence that you really need to uh, revise and remember. I should say too, you really want to showcase a broad and detailed knowledge of the text. You don't want it to be narrow. So for characters, say, for example, you don't want every paragraph just to be about Jeff. You'd want to bring in some of those secondary characters. 
And even though this particular essay question does have Jeff in the question or in the statement, that doesn't necessarily mean you should just focus on Jeff because of course, we've got his relationship with Lisa and with his neighbors and they play a really important role in terms of the way that he views his own life. So the introduction will be the first paragraph that you write, no doubt, although some of you might choose differently. But I think the intro is the best place to start, not only because it's the opening paragraph, but because I guess it sets the tone for the rest of your essay. The first thing you probably want to do is introduce the text. Um, I like doing that through either a brief plot description or probably more so provide some context information, whether it's about you know the Cold War and McCarthyism, if the essay is about sort of voyeurism, or perhaps about you know traditional gender roles and expectations if it, if it was about gender. Now state your contention or your answer to the topic. Um, again, some students like to do that just to start with. They like their opening sentence to be the contention to just really underscore to the examiner or to the marker that they are responding to this specific topic. Again, I should note there's no hard and fast rules here. VCAR don't say this is in, this is what you must do, this is in what order, or even this has to be the answer to your, to your topic. Examiners don't say students can only score full marks if they argue this way or, or that way. It does really give you a blank canvas in terms of how you want to respond to a question. And the advice today is really a bit of a safety net. If you're struggling to put your thoughts together in a coherent manner, this is a way that I think is quite logical. Once you sort of nail this structure, then you can move away from it and perhaps experiment with a few different things. The other thing, going back to our introduction, is you want to outline your arguments, your key ideas or your reasons. This is called signposting, and you want to show the examiner a little bit about why you have your contention and what the rest of the essay is going to discuss. And written expression is really important here. You want to be concise. You don't want to ramble on, you don't want a really long introduction. You want it to be direct and to the point because where you're going to find most of your marks is in your analysis and that will come up in your main body paragraphs. So introduction, as you write more and more, particularly under time conditions, see if you can get it down to you know, under the 10 minute mark to give you sort of that 15 minutes on each main body paragraph. This is a bit of a template on what or how you might structure your introduction. Again, the first sentence might be that overview of the film, maybe a plot description or context information. Sentence two, where you'll state your contention. Sentence three and beyond will be where you outline your arguments. And again, you might use some connectives there. Once again, you don't have to, but this might be a really useful way to outline your arguments in a logical and rational order. And maybe even a final sentence might be, say, a main message of the film or some authorial intent in relation to the actual essay topic. Again, there's no hard and fast rules, but the specific topic that you've chosen may, may lend itself to doing that. Let's look at example one. This is sort of a mid-range introduction, I think. Set during thriving post-war America, Alfred Hitchcock's thriller Rear Window investigates the influence of widespread McCarthyism on the indulger. Expressed through protagonist L.B. Jeffries, Hitchcock examines the emotional repercussions of warism on both Jeffries and his relationship, as well as the deprivation of Jeffries' individualism. Ultimately, Hitchcock engineers Jeffries' propensity to comment on 1950s McCarthyism. This is a pretty solid introduction. It's that mid to high range. Um, personally, I think it's a little bit wordy at times. The word indulger, say for example, I think you could be a little bit more clear in what you mean by that. But there's some good context information. They've responded to the topic in some detail and they've outlined the ideas that they want to discuss. It's probably a fraction short, if anything. And again, perhaps they might want to sort of flesh out slightly more um, the arguments that they're going to discuss in the essay. But still, it's on topic and they've done a relatively good job, which lends itself to being in that mid to high range. The next example is more in a high range, but once again, um, there are things that I think they could improve. Released in 1954, Alfred Hitchcock's rear window reflects upon the rampant suspicion and distrust of others that arose from the Cold War, notably the American public's newfound fondness for voyeurism and its potentiality for diminishing introspection. 
Hitchcock accomplishes this through exploring the life of LB Jeff Jeffries, a wheelchair band man who is now constricted to his home after an accident in his career as a photojournalist. Consequently, Jeffries' strong voyeuristic tendencies are amplified as he finds little time to deal with his problems, instead choosing to obsess over those of which he can see through his rear window. However, Jeffries' character is seen to develop throughout the film despite his captivation in living vicariously. Ultimately, through observing and analysing the lives of others, Jeffries is forced to confront his current perspective and examine the foundation of his ethics and the basis of his principles. So I think this is slightly better than the one we saw previously. Um, they've got that context information early. They address the topic relatively early. They've used the word introspection as well to address that. And we can kind of see they're going to argue both ways. They're going to go with that initially. Um, yeah, absolutely. He finds it very difficult um, to look at, at himself. But in the end, he has to confront his own perspective. And I'm going to assume that they're going to be talking about his relationship and his voyeurism in that third main body paragraph. Let's talk main body paragraphs. And as I mentioned previously, this is where most of your marks are going to come. This is where you'll be analysing and showcasing your knowledge of the text. This is where you will flesh out each argument, the ones that you've referenced in your introduction. You really want to include a range of evidence to showcase a detailed knowledge of the text, not just quotations, obviously, but also film techniques. You want to analyse and explain the evidence and how it strengthens your arguments. And you need to remain on topic at all times. I think something that VK have been pretty consistent on over the past, well, I guess we've been doing this study design now for six years, is that they really, really, really stress the fact that students need to remain on topic. And they found that a lot of students have come in with sort of pre-prepared essays and they'll loosely link, be linked to the actual topic itself. But you really need to make sure that you're considering every single word in the topic and exploring and explaining your evidence in relation to that. I mean, Teal is what most of us have sort of been using through most of our high school life. Um, this is, I guess, a variation of that. Um, the one thing I'll sort of say, and I'll go through each aspect of, of Teal in a moment, but the main thing I think to do is to bring in, say, two pieces of evidence or two examples and explain them. That will ensure that you, I guess, can showcase, again, that, that broad, detailed, in-depth knowledge of the text, and you're not just relying on sort of one key piece of evidence per idea. Let's look at topic sentences. You want to make sure your topic sentence does sort of, I guess, two or three things. The first one is it needs to engage with the topic and the words and vocabulary in the topic. Feel free to use synonyms or even antonyms, I guess, um, if it happens to, to so work. But you want to make sure that there's some link in your topic sentence to the actual essay topic. You want to pinpoint a specific focus area for the paragraph as well in your topic sentence. And I guess this is pretty you know, um, straightforward, but you want to link it to the text somehow. For me, I'm always thinking sort of either about Hitchcock or about societal norms. Got a couple of sentence starters there that you might find useful. Um, you know, the film explores, Hitchcock presents, Rewindo examines. These are nice sentence starters to introduce your ideas. You also might find connectives or conjunctions work really well too. So for your second main body paragraph, it might be furthermore or moreover. Um, your last main body paragraph might be ultimately. Um, we want to steer clear of the firstly, secondly, thirdly. It's a bit uh, mathsy, it's a bit clunky. Um, again, you don't need to have connectives, but you might find there a way to connect your arguments together in a, again, in a smooth manner. But once again, there's no real hard and fast rules here. There are plenty of other verbs that you could use as well for your topic sentences, and I'll get to that in a little bit. In fact, let's do it now. Um, the three I like to use are explores, examines, and presents, and I definitely use those in my comparative as well. So. Um, these are all can be used for your comparative as well. Other ones sort of portrays and, and depicts, they're similar to presents. You know, emphasizes, illustrates, demonstrates, suggests, highlights, they're all really good verbs to use as well. Um, and if you're talking about Hitchcock, you could even bring in some of those authorial um, intent verbs, you know, Hitchcock scrutinizes or Hitchcock endorses or promotes. Um, these are again verbs that we'll look at a little bit later on. The main thing, as I said, with your topic sentences is to ensure you're clearly outlining your idea and being consistent with that idea 
throughout the rest of that main body paragraph. Evidence is pretty straightforward as well. Um, quotations, embed them fluently. Uh, don't use massive chunks of quotes, you know, short, sharp quotes work really well. Um, film techniques are a must as well. Um, use meta language where possible. So, you know, close ups, low camera angles, the cool shop effect, editing, mise en scene, all those great pieces of meta language are really useful and show that you understand this film. And when talking about film techniques, you know, use those verbs, utilizes, employs, implements, supplies, um, you know, Hitchcock employs um, the cool shop effects, or Hitchcock utilizes dim lighting. I think the verb uses is sometimes used a bit too much. So think about not just users when doing that. That's definitely not where the evidence ends either. You can use symbols throughout the text and you know it could be anything from the red light outside Thorwald's apartment, it could be the wedding ring, it could be the long focus lens or, or binoculars. And obviously context details can be used as, as evidence as well. Um, obviously you can't, you know, you're not going to go out and quote a historian, but you can definitely make a context statement and use that as evidence to support one of your ideas. If I'm doing a little bit of maths, um, I'd be aiming for at least two quotations and two film techniques per main body paragraph. Um, again, there's no hard and fast rules, but for me that sort of ensures that you're show showcasing a really detailed knowledge of the text. My last point there is really important as well you know you want to avoid broad examples and use specific moments in the film so the first one i don't really like it's a bit broad hitchcock continuously uses the cool effect throughout the film to show jeff's reaction to certain events that happen in the neighborhood it is broad um, what are jeff's reactions what events are happening in the neighborhood whereas the second one's a little bit better as jeffries is observing the newlywed couple locked in a passionate embrace hitchcock employs the cool effect to depict the protagonist's guilt laden reaction Again, um, you'll obviously explain that evidence in a bit more detail, but it is a specific example um, of Jeff looking at the newlyweds. Speaking of explanation, it's so important that you analyse or explain any evidence that you bring into your essay. And you want to do it in relation to either the paragraph topic or the essay topic itself. Now, a little subtle way to ensure that you're doing that is to use those explanation verbs to ensure that you are explaining and we'll get to those in a moment. But consider using Hitchcock's name and exploring his directorial intent. So Hitchcock's name and explanation verb goes a long way just to ensuring that you're not just outlining evidence, but you're explaining it. The other point I want to make is to avoid repeating your analysis. If you're saying the same thing twice, then really consider either another example or thinking about another way to say whatever it is that you're trying to say in your own analysis. These are some explanation verbs that I like. A couple of my favourites, highlights, elucidates, underscores, and connotes. They're probably four of my favourite ones. But again, the list doesn't end here. Um, some of them aren't always, you're not always able, I guess, to replace one with the other. Um, so really think about some of these verbs if you're not too sure what they mean. Research their meaning, their, their definition, and in your practice essays, you know, experiment with some of these words and terms. In terms of the authorial intent or the directorial intent verbs, um, the ones on the left are positive. So these are messages that Hitchcock is promoting or endorsing, celebrating, championing, or supporting. Those messages or ideas that Hitchcock wants to promote in this film. The ones on the right-hand side are a bit more negative. So think about what Hitchcock is condemning or challenging, critiquing, questioning, or scrutinizing and perhaps one of those things that he's endorsing could be something like you know independent women and something he's condemning is the obsession with voyeurism and suspicion but again these are really good phrases and verbs to use to ensure that you are analyzing your examples the last point that i want to make is your linking sentences you want to make sure you're connecting your paragraph topic to the essay topic. It is similar to your topic sentence, so consider using synonyms or sentence structures, you know, varying sentence structures um, to ensure you're not just simply repeating your topic sentence. Something else to consider as well is some students end up sort of embedding their link into their analysis 
Again, this is probably something that you can afford to do once you're really confident with your essay structure. And there's that little logo at the very bottom. Read the question, answer the question. This sentence is really important because it just reminds the examiner or the marker that you are responding to the specific question. So don't forget your RTFQ and your ATFQ. That's a good example one. This is a mid-range response. Hitchcock presents various relationship outlooks throughout the community complex with Jeffrey's attention directed at all except his own with his girlfriend, Lisa. Through consistent voyeurism, Jeffries is captivated by the relationship between Mr. and Mrs. Thorwald. Hitchcock incorporates a close-up and a mid-shot to encapsulate the affection Lisa shows Jeff and Jeff failing to reciprocate. Jeffrey starts a conversation with Lisa about problems and mentions why would a man leave his apartment three times with a suitcase and come back three times, instantly suggesting that Jeffrey's attention is still on Mr. Thorwald and not his girlfriend Lisa. Hitchcock utilises the close-up to demonstrate Jeff's mind wandering elsewhere whilst Lisa focuses on him. A mid-shot combined with the cool shot effect of Jeffries and Lisa, both analysing the newlyweds, shows that their curiosity prevents them from viewing themselves. Hitchcock utilises the cool shot effect to show the contrast between Jeff's relationship and the newlyweds. Hitchcock uses this scene to demonstrate Jeff's fascination with other community relationships, hence directing his attention to other relationships rather than his own. Moreover, Jeff's fixation with the Thorwalds and the community relationships stops him from examining the ethics of his own behaviour. This is a mid to high range for a few reasons. Um, one, they've showcased a pretty good knowledge of the text. They brought in some quotations and they brought in some film techniques as well. If I was to critique this paragraph, I'd say there's probably not enough analysis in this. I think their verbs particularly are repetitive, like the word shows comes up a lot and we really want to word up. And even just the mentioning of the film techniques is a little bit repetitive as well. So I feel like they're spending more time on the evidence than the analysis. And I think my focus would probably want to be more so on analysis. In saying that, it's clearly structured and it is relevant to the topic itself as well about Jeff's fascination stops him from looking at himself. So look, it's that means a high range. It does a pretty good job, but I definitely think they could improve in a few areas, mainly in their analysis and their repetition. Let's have a look at a high range paragraph and you'll notice just visually as well, it's a little bit longer. That's not to say that longer is necessarily better. Sometimes longer can mean that the student is actually repeating themselves and waffling on a bit too much. But let's read through this high range paragraph. Jeffrey's indulgence in his voyeuristic tendencies renders him devoid of compassion for others. Both Lisa and the unknowing court, courtyard inhabitants become subject to Jeffrey's unwarranted judgments and emotional withdrawal as a direct influence of his voyeurism. This first becomes evident when Jeffrey's observes his res residence via his portable keyhole. By concealing Jeffrey's eyes with the binoculars that reflect the outside world, Hitchcock alludes to the dehumanisation, lack of morality and lack of empathy projected by his protagonist. Continually, Lars Thorwald, who the audience are complicit in seeing through Jeffrey's telephoto lens through cinematic vignetting, is depicted with glasses throughout the film. Hence, the lack of compassion embodied by Jeffreys is paralleled to that of Thorwald's, as Hitchcock suggests Jeffreys to be a detached, emotionless man capable of murdering his own wife. Furthermore, Jeffreys emotional isolation from the community is highlighted after the murder of the dog. Pictured in a long shot, towering high above her counterparts, Hitchcock demonstrates the dog's owner's moral superiority as she condemns them for their lack of care for whether or not anybody lives or dies. Despite this, the camera leaves Jeffrey's apartment, shooting Miss Torso low-angled close-ups, harbouring looks of concern and empathy. In doing so, Hitchcock emphasises the emotive rapprochement of women in the community, juxtaposed against Jeff's neutral expression to illustrate further his social disconnect and lack of empathy for those around him. Not only does Jeffrey's emotional dislocation relate to those he psychoanalyzes under his lens, but also to his love interest, Lisa. Derived through neighboring relationships, Jeffrey's myopic and stereotypical views on marriage act as catalysts in placing a divide in his own. Initially established in the Thorwald's marriage where the wife ridicules her husband's coquettish phone call, Jeffrey's ruling on his neighborhood, neighboring marriage are converged to that of rushing home to a hot apartment and automatic laundry. Thus, through Jeffrey's view that marriage is suffocating and restrictive, he simultaneously stems the opportunity for compassion in his own. And overall, by imprinting the marital dynamics of others onto his own, 
Jeffries reduces compassion in his relationship with Lisa. This is a bit of a high range essay. I think it's a little bit clunky at times, actually, particularly in, in the middle. I'd be looking just to workshop, especially the example with Lars Thor. I think it's good, but I think, again, the expression is a little bit clunky. So workshop that, but I think the vocab is pretty good. It's not too over the top. Sometimes vocab can be a bit too over the top. I like the the word, the adjective coquettish. Um, that's one from, from Seinfeld, actually. Um, but film techniques are there, evidence is there, and they're um, obviously ensuring that these examples refer to the topic itself. So again, not, not a perfect main body paragraph by all means, but one that does a pretty good job in exploring the topic. All right, conclusion, pretty simple. These are things you need to do. Restate your contention, outline your arguments, you want to probably avoid bringing any new information or evidence. And if you want to finish with your strongest argument or piece of analysis as a way to wrap up, but um, you don't want to spend too much time on this, you know, two or three sentences is fine. You know, the rule generally is you can't gain marks from a conclusion. You know, a mark is not going to go, wow, that was such a great conclusion. Um, they're not going to sort of boost your mark off a conclusion, but you could potentially lose marks if it's not either consistent or it's it's clunky or, or doesn't do the job that we're asking you to do, which is pretty much summarise your contention and, and arguments. Here's a mid to high range sort of um, conclusion. Ultimately, while Jeffrey's at times excessive indulgence in the lives of others causes him to ignore his own, it cannot be said that it prevents him from examining his self or himself as his character undergoes perhaps the most dramatic change of the film. Instead, Jeffrey's insight formed from his voyeurism into others acts as a foil to his ontology, allowing him to develop and contemplate his relationship with Lisa, desires and his philosophy on life. Jeffrey's voyeuristic tendencies do not hinder his ability to look at himself, but indeed spur them on. Again, it does the job, it wraps up their arguments and contention and is on topic. Something I wanted to discuss is formal writing and maintaining a formal writing tone throughout your essay is going to be really, really important. These are just a couple of rules that I would follow um, as I'm writing. The first one I'm hoping is pretty straightforward. You've been writing essays for a while now and we need to make sure we're writing in first, th sorry, in third person. There's a Freudian slip. So avoid I, my or we. We want to stick to third person. Hitchcock, the film, Rewindow so forth. Avoid judgments where you can. Remember you are analysing the film, not evaluating it. So, you know, Hitchcock cleverly, you know, employs vignettes. Well, just be mindful of, of that ad adverb because you want to avoid judgments. Um, again, you're analysing the film. Use active voice, not passive voice. You know, Jeffrey's perspective rather than the perspective of Jeffrey's. We really want to maintain that active voice. Once again, it's that it's important when, you, when you're analysing something that you are actively doing so. Avoid slang terms, avoid using cliches or similes, that comes up a little bit, and avoid contractions as well. Um, you know, Jeffries can't, no, it's Jeffries cannot. We want to use full words here. And something that might not, yeah, might not never need to know really, but something that I like doing as a rule of thumb is to write out numbers, one to a hundred. Um, anything more than 100, unless it's, you know, like a round number, like, you know, a thousand or a million, um, I generally use numbers for that. But 1 to 100, yeah, spell it out. These are some band words that um, should never be in your essay. I, my, us and we. They are, of course, first person. We want to avoid those. Words like essay and theme, I think, are a bit um, explicit. We sort of want to avoid that. And words like thing and good or bad are really basic and even a word like gets as well i find they're just too simplistic you need to word up um, thing could be an aspect uh, a trait a characteristic a quality a, a factor a thing could be a range of other words good and bad i mean good promising um, optimistic positive you know bad negative pessimistic challenging difficult look to word up there the word contention is similar to the word essay. It's a bit too explicit. Avoid, you know, a word like quotes, you know, this quote or this quote quotation, we want to sort of avoid that. 
Uh, contractions we've spoken about before and avoid asking questions, I think. Essays, when you write an essay, you're there to, to answer questions, not to ask them. And just to wrap up, a couple of really brief points. Continuously draft and edit your work and seek feedback on anything you write, whether it's one paragraph or a full essay, always seek feedback from your teacher. They are your number one resource. And something else to consider doing is to, you know, hold on to your essays at the end of each unit. Um, look back on how you were writing at the start and look at the improvement that you've made from start to finish. Consider using synonyms and reworking sentence structures to ensure you don't sound repetitive. Um, synonyms particularly, I think, are really useful to use. You know, voyeurism is one of those words that comes up a lot, but think about, you know, using phrases or terms like, you know, observing or spying or leering even. Um, these are things to, to consider. Make sure, you, of course, you embed your quotations fluently and build quotation and idea banks as well and look at a range of topics. Get a gauge on which ideas and evidence are flexible, you know, because if you find you're using the same examples over and over again, you know, the chances are that they're good examples that you'll be able to fit into any sort of topic you get. So again, look at a range of topics. But uh, with essay writing, think about using this video as a place to start. And once you build your confidence, you can start to experiment with things like you know, language and vocab and so forth.